<clears throat> How are we feeling? Yeah, all right? Could you just turn to the person next to you and make sure they're still awake? <laughs> first thing. Um, first question. Who's got children in school at the minute? You poor buggers. Um, the system's broken. The system's broken. And the, 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 the words behind me are exactly what I've been trying to do for the past 20 years. I've been trying to challenge the norm. Um, and to do that, it's really difficult because I'm dealing with politicians. And politicians don't like you to challenge them. They don't like to challenge the norm. It's just the way it is. That's life. Um, so uh, recently, I was being called, and I'm quite proud of this, enemy number one of the education system in the UK. Yes! <laughs> Finally done it! Yes! Enemy number one. The only problem is I'm still waiting for that van to come past with the blacked out windows, the door to open, me to disappear, and you'll never see me again. Because it's coming. It's coming. I'm going to tell a story, though, because there is a backstory to this. It's not just about education. It's about society as a whole. And we need to understand that. Um, and I'm going to tell a story about this young man. Yes, it's me. Yes, it's me. Um, uh, I show this photo. You know, when I go to the States and do this talk, I, I show this photo, and they, uh, in the States, they all go, oh. Here in the UK, they go, oh, twat. <laughs> oh, oh, you know. Anyway, anyway. That's 1977. I was five. You can work out how old I am now. Uh, I came from a very impoverished background. Dad was a miner, mum was a cleaner. We had nothing. We didn't have carpets. Uh, we had one of those um, plug-in cookers with the two rings. We didn't have a fridge, we didn't have a telly. Sounds terrible, but I loved it. I loved it. I didn't know anything different. I slept on the floor in my bedroom. I didn't know any different. That was life. That's what it was all about. The only problem was, that little boy was going through an education system that was poor, really, really poor. And I remember, I use this photo because I remember that year so well. I remember a teacher stood there and another adult who I don't know was stood there. And the teacher said to this other adult, don't bother teaching him to read, he's going down the pit. And I remember that as if it was yesterday. That was the first time that I realized that my life, my dreams, might not become a reality. And when you're that old and your dreams, the only thing that you've got when you've got nothing, other people don't care about them. That was hard because I did have a dream. That dream was to fly airplanes. That's what I wanted to do. I used to watch airplanes at the weekends. I used to get on my cycle. I used to ride five miles to watch them take off and come back. All I wanted to do was join the Royal Air Force. But how does a boy from an impoverished background get anywhere close to that? Well, I decided at the age of 12, there's only one person who's going to make it happen. And that was me. So I got a job. And I got a job because I knew my chances of becoming a pilot in the Air Force were greatly increased if I had a pilot's license. <laughs> it's true. So I got a job washing pots at a local restaurant. Six nights a week, age 12. I started at seven, I finished around midnight. I did that for five years. I didn't spend a penny. Not one penny. And at the end of it, I had enough money to get my pilot's license. 17 and four months, I qualified as a private pilot. Get me. <laughs> Did it. OK. Now I've got my pilot's license. I've got my qualifications. I worked hard. I got those as well. I did the application form. I went off to Biggin Hill, as it was in those days, office selection for the Royal Air Force. I was accepted. 
onto the selection procedure. It was a five-day procedure in those days. 50 started at the beginning of the week. Monday, we all turned up, 50 of us. By the end of the week, if you got to the end of the week, you were in, pretty much, give or take. And every time, it was normally every sort of break, they would call a few away, and they'd go through a door, and you'd never see them again. <laughs> Where they went, nobody knew. But as the week went on, it was becoming less and less and less of us. By the end of the week, there was three left. And guess what? I was one of the three. There was me and two lads from private school. Nice guys, actually. Still in touch with them. And we sat in this room, and we were really nervous. Has it happened? Have we done it? Is it, could it be, could I have achieved the dream? First boy goes in, he comes out, he's high-fiving us, he's hugging. We're like, yes. Next one was called in. He comes out, he's high-fiving, he's hugging, we're all hugging together. And I thought, I've done it. I've actually done it. All that hard work paid off. I was called into the room. There were two RAF officers standing, uh, sitting in front of me. I went and I sat down at a chair. The first RAF officer said to me, Sonny, well done. There are very few who get to Friday. You've passed everything. Not just passed everything, passed everything with flying colours. Yes, I thought. The second one piped up. But. No commissioned officer in the Royal Air Force has a father who reads the Daily Mirror. And your father reads the Daily Mirror. We're not selecting you. However, we do have a cook's job, and you can have that instead. Late 80s, miners weren't overly popular. Do you remember? <laughs> My dad was a miner, and society, as in the system, didn't like miners. And because of where I came from, and the family I came from, my dream was destroyed. I remember that trip home, feeling like the, the world had fallen from beneath me. I spent the next six months feeling like that. I got a few part-time jobs. But it got to the point where I had to do something with my life. So I decided that I wasn't enjoying these jobs. I'll, I'll do something. I'll, I'll go into some kind of business. I'll buy a business. And happened, it fell in my lap. Somebody came along and said, I'm selling my business. Do you want it? And I said, yeah. Fantastic, how much? He said, a pound. A pound? Wow. What kind of business is it? <laughs> what do you get for a pound? He said, you get 300,000 pounds worth of debt. Guess what? I took it. I took it. I learned about change management. I learned about engaging a workforce. I learned about how you could have flat structures uh, so that everybody's pulling together to make it work. I brought every single member of my team on board to make it a success. And five years later, the business was turning over 10.8 million. And I was bored. I was 24, and I was bored. And I realized something. And I, again, I remember this like yesterday. I was stood. Um, by the way, the, the, the business was a nightclub, if you're if you not. You know, it was a chain of nightclubs in the end. I stood at the Nottingham nightclub Christmas Eve. It was snowing. And I decided that actually, I'm not actually giving anything back to society. And what happened to me as a youngster was out of order. And we need to change that. 
So that point in time, I decided I was going to go back to education and try and affect one young person's life. Just one. So that, what happened to me wouldn't happen to them. And in a, in a weird, strange sort of way, I made the decision then, and that was it. I was selling the business to the partner who I had, and off we go. And within nine months, I was enrolling at university, and then I spent four years pissing all the money up the wall that I'd earned over those past five years. Fine, no problems. But I became a teacher, and I did really well at it. But the problem with it was I'd got a business mind on my head, and I was going into education. And when I went into education, something weird happened. And the weird was I found on my first few days as a teacher that the things teachers do were not for kids. It was for the system. And I asked one question, and I've not stopped asking that one question. That one question is, why? Why do we do that when it has no effect? Why do we do that if that's not improving their lives? And I became the mosquito. And from that day on, I decided that I was going to go and find out what are the best school systems out there? What are the best things that we could do? So I traveled the world. I went to the best schools in the world, and I brought all that information back with me. And I said, right, one day, we're going to have a school, and we're going to put all of this in there. That chance came in 2009, where I saw an advert in the newspaper. And all this advert says was, please save our school. We need a head teacher from the parents. I decided to go and have a look at this school. It was in a place called Lincoln. I hadn't really been to Lincoln before. I thought, oh, nice day out. We'll go to Lincoln. And I got to this school, and instantly I knew this school was having problems. The reason I knew is because there were kids running around the playground, but it wasn't playtime. <laughs> Not only that, there were two members of staff doing this to a kid who was sat on top of the gate. Please come down. Please come down. And I got to the gate, and he just looked down at me and went, I'm not getting down. Well, I said, can I come through? Yeah, no problem. So I opened the gate. He swung out with the gate, and I swung it back again and shut the gate. I went in that school, and it was chaos. It was like Beirut on a bad day. There was no teaching and learning going off, and the kids were running riot. After about half an hour, I walked back to the door. I walked back to my car going, no chance. Nobody's going to take that school on. It's the worst I've seen. But by the time I got to my car and I grabbed, my, grabbed the car door, I remember looking back up at the school door and thinking, if I don't, nobody will. So I applied for the job. Guess what? I was the only one who applied for the job. <laughs> Guess what? I got the job. <laughs> I don't know why, but I did. <clears throat> and I think this is really important. Because as soon as I got the job, the local authority said to me, I'd signed the bottom line. There's a contract signed. Local authority turned around and went, oh, there's one thing we forgot to tell you. We're closing this school in six months' time if you don't improve it. I was the 15th head teacher in seven years. What chance did I have? What chance did I have? Anyway, I thought, well, I will give it a go. We'll give it our best shot. And on the first day was an inset day, and all the staff sat there growling at me. They're all looking at me as if to say, oh, here we go, another planning format that's going to change the world. And I turned around to them, and I said, look, hold on a minute. If we're going to do this, we've got to do this together. But if we're going to do this, we're going to have to change our mindsets as well. We're going to have to think differently about this. Go back to your classrooms now and go and fetch all the things you've been told to do over the past seven years, all the schemes of work, all the curriculums, all the planning, all those strategies that were put in place to make it better. Go and get them now. And they all got up. One of the teachers, no word of a lie, turned around and shouted, Wanker! As they left the room.
I thought, whoa, this is going to be harder than I thought. <laughs> uh, anyway, they'd gone, and I prepared outside some fire doors here. I ran out. I opened the fire doors, and I dragged in one of those great big steel bins. You know, with the three wheels on the bottom? Huge thing. I dragged it into the hall before they all came back, and I stood there dead coolly against this bin. <laughs> and they all came back in, even the person who called me a wanker. And I said, put all that in there. Put all that in there. All of it. And they reluctantly did it. And then I dragged that bin outside and I said, come with me. I pulled diesel in that bin and I set fire to it. <laughs> it was great. <laughs> From that moment onwards, I proved to my staff that we needed to think differently. And I went back in that hall and I said, I'm not going to tell you how to teach. I'm not going to tell you what to teach. You're not going to use this to teach. You're going to use this to teach. Go and do it. And they did. The worst, well, the fifth worst, let's not exaggerate, the fifth worst school in the country became one of the best schools in the country in under two years. That was the success story. Those kids were amazing. Those same, same staff and the person who called me a wanker is still there today. <laughs> How? I don't know. Right. So, to understand the education system, we've got to understand where it comes from. The education system actually is fundamentally broken. And that story sort of illustrates that if you think differently, you can do differently. You can change the education system. But the government don't want you to. Why? Well, the education system came around in the 1870s. And the first education bill was published. Everybody had to go to school. And at the time, well, even now, people still think that people went to school to improve their chances, to improve their life chances. Wrong. It was nothing to do with that. It was to prepare the young people for the factories. It was to make them compliant. The Victorian factories were very like school. At the beginning of the day, a bell rang. Everybody went and went to their place. They sat down at their place and they got on with their work. If they got stuck or there was a problem, they had to put their hand up and their supervisor would come over. At lunchtime, a bell rang. And then a bell rang at the end of lunchtime. Then a bell rang at the end of the day. If you wanted to go to the toilet, you had to put your hand up. Does that remind you of anything? Because it does me. And actually, has schooling changed? No, it hasn't. We're the only industry left that hasn't changed for 140 years. Why? Because the politicians want compliant individuals to go out into society. They don't want free thinkers. And I've discovered this with the past 20 years' research, that I've been poking and prodding at it and thinking about it. Actually, schooling is nothing to do with improving life chances. I've, I don't know if you've come across this thing called pupil premium. Pupil premium is money that's spent on those who are free school meals. They've spent about four and a half billion pounds on it. It's had zero effect over the past five years. Why? Because it's designed to have zero effect over, over that time. This is the state of the education system now. And if we aren't strong enough and actually stand up to it, we're going to end up with an education system like this in 130 years' time. We need to do something about it. Am I really standing here and saying that our schooling system is about making compliant individuals for the future? Of course our kids don't go into compliant industries in our country, or do they? 93% of the industries in our country are about compliance. And then people wonder why 85% of our employees are actively not involved in their jobs. Something's got to change. Something's got to move somewhere. We actually went and we, we, we spread the, these theories. It's great. OK, do, do kids feel this? So we actually went and asked, do you enjoy school? What percentage? There were 6,000 kids, by the way, age 6 to 13, mixed demographic. What percentage do you think said yes? Twenty-three. 
22. 22% of them said yes. Now, should we be over the moon that nearly a quarter are enjoying school? Or should we be questioning that nearly 80% don't? We went on from that and we asked this question, what's the best thing about school? Shout at me. <laughs> Lunch times, break times, some might, I would have said PE, some would have said art, some would have said music. I've asked this to about 50,000 teachers, that same question. Not one of them, yes, yet has said anything about maths and English. They've all said what you said. Actually, 64% of them said home time. That's the best thing about school. And the biggest thing that sticks in my mind from that survey was one eight-year-old boy, deprived family, deprived background. And he said, I live for the end of the day because then I can start living. That's our education system. It needs upheaval and it needs changing. And it needs changing quickly. If we don't change it, all we're going to have is this. I'm using this as a metaphor for our industries as well, our employees that are out there. We've got to get the whole of society moving. Why is this country one of the only countries that aren't doing that with education? Why are we holding our kids back? It seems really bizarre. So that's a question that I've been asking for many years now. One of the things I did was, Actually, let's go and try and find the answer. Let's actually look at these young people who are coming in and let's think about them as little human beings. What do little human beings need? Hold on a minute. Let me change that. What do little human beings need and what do big human beings need to be engaged in their professions, to be engaged in school? How do we get them excited about work so they're excited at work? And how do we get the leaders of the future to excite our workforce and make it more profitable and productive and actually sort out some of the moral problems that we've got now and what's coming? Well, this is something that, that I've been going over in my mind for ages. And one of the things that I'd noticed in the research was you get these little kids at age four coming into school and they're full of absolute curiosity. All they want to do is learn. That's all they want to do. And they will run around, they will learn all day long. By the time they get to 11, all of that's gone. And I'm noticing more and more that those 11 year olds are putting their hand up and asking if they can turn the page. What's happening between there and there? How are we taking that away from them? But more than that, Whose fault is this that we're taking that away from them, that passion for learning, that drive, that desire? Well, quite simply, it's our fault. Our fault as educationists, and we've got to do something about that. Because if we don't, the others won't. One five-year-old boy, it, this was in the summer, I was visiting a school. I get asked by lots of head teachers now, can you come and see my school? Or can you come and help me out a bit? Um, summed it all up for me. This little five-year-old boy came up to me like this. Didn't know me from Adam. He had a chest full of stickers. He also had the biggest snot coming out of his nose as well. <laughs> and it was sort of going across his top lip. So I wiped his nose first. That was the first thing we did. And I went, wow, there's loads of stickers. You must be really good at something. What did you do? And he went, huh, yep. Got these in a week. <laughs> yeah, just this week. And I haven't changed my jumper this week, so they're all still on there. So what did you do? Seriously, what did you do to get all those stickers? I sat silently on the carpet all week. And I got all these stickers. Hold on a minute, you're five. What do you mean you sat silently on the carpet all week? The point that I'm making is we're getting kids into the school system and we're making them compliant instantly still. By the time they're 11, they're incredibly compliant. By the time they leave school, 
all they want to do is leave school. Not really well educated. Actually, not really ready for the world. But our school system is pushing us in that direction constantly. And I'll say again, the school system's broken. One of the bits of research that came out of this was a connection. And we work with psychologists. Um, and actually, I went back to university and did a, a, a master's in psychology. And we, we looked at this. And we looked at this with the medical profession, too. And we said, what is going off here? And one of the things that came out of that research was the connection between motivation, attitude, and engagement. If you can get people motivated and get them with the right attitude, you'll engage them. But you've got to have certain factors in place. There are actually eight levels of motivation. This is the science, by the way. Eight levels of motivation. They've all got different names. And the weird bit, or not the weird bit, is that when we started to look at this, we started to break these down and started to look at these, not just in the school system, but within the workplace as well, there was something that came out quite highly. Number one, the unmotivated, or those who don't care, is around 2 to 5% of school and of the workforce. Interested or interesting. But the biggest piece that was interesting was the level one. I do this to avoid consequence. In other words, I come to school, I do as I'm told, I don't care about it, and actually, I'm less than 5% engaged. But I do it, because I have to. That is 80% of school children. But it's also 80% of people in the workplace. They don't want to be there. And if they had a choice, they could go somewhere else. One of our lowest motivational factors in being human, as uh, psychology goes, is the majority of our population in this country. I'll skip the next few. You get a few of those um, in, in classrooms. You don't get many of those. And that's all about being in prison. You've got no choice. The bit that was more interesting than anything was the next bit, level five to seven. The most engaged, the most motivated you can be to either be in school or do your job. And it was all around intrinsic motivation. Intrinsic motivation to know. I'm curious. That five-year-old kid is curious, and you can get so much out of them. That 11-year-old kid is not curious and they don't care. Their productivity has gone through the floor. And we went to industry as well, and we checked it with industry, and that's exactly the same. As soon as you've got a kid curious, or you've got an employee curious, they want to go further. They want to know more. They want to research it. They want to find out about it. And then they go to level six, and they start to master it. As soon as they start to master it, something happens. Endorphins are released in the brain. You start to get a bit of a high, a bit of a kick. Your self-esteem goes up, and then you start to enjoy it. Can you imagine that? Enjoying work or enjoying school? All of our research and all the things that we do within education at the moment, because we're consulting with education, we're working with hundreds of schools across the world, to try and get them to think like this. But we're also doing it with business too, to try and get employees engaged. And again, we're working with lots of businesses out there to increase productivity. And all we're working on are these qualities here. Can we get them curious? Can we get them self-regulating to know more? And as soon as their self-esteem starts to go up, they start to enjoy their job, and they become more profitable. The thing is, the workplace is changing. Not so much in this country, but when I travel the world and I go to workplaces like this, it's happening all over the place. They're about 30% more pro productive than industries that don't think about their workforce, and their workforce is just doing. This is what we're putting into schools with teachers. This is what we're putting into schools with kids. The problem we've got is, when I go back to this, 
and I go back to these levels, this bottom bit here is not on the curriculum for trainee teachers. Anybody any guess why it's not on the curriculum for trainee teachers? It's, it's nothing to do with measures because the, the results do come. What happens is when you do this, you get kids asking questions. You get kids thinking for themselves. You get kids debating, and you get kids excited. And they start to question society. This is frowned upon by the government because the government doesn't want kids asking questions. All that leads to is revolution. Hold on a minute. That's why we're all here. We're the crazy ones. We're trying to change this so that workplaces like this are engaging and are exciting. Schools get kids thinking for themselves, working out how they want to work, where they want to work, and being highly productive doing it. Thinking, problem solving, creating. A world that actually is quite an exciting place to be. Can we have kids skipping into school? And can we have kids skipping out of school and going to their parents and their parents asking the question, what did you do at school today? What's the standard answer? Nothing. Can we get them saying, oh, I did this and I did that and I was excited about this and I learned about this? Because when we get them to that point, we know we've won. Let's go back to Hartsome Academy. Hartsome changed. It became one of the best performing schools. The government found out about me. They found out about the school. And for the past three years, all I've had is the government trying to shoot the school down. They're not far off succeeding in beating it. The problem isn't necessarily that we can't do it, because we can and we've proved it. The problem is there's not enough of us, parents, to shout loud enough for our kids to get a decent education. The other bit of my research recently has been around the difference between the curriculum in the state sector and the private sector. The state sector curriculum has narrowed to a point where there's not much left. The private sector has expanded and they're getting really good curriculum basis. Why? Maybe that's a question you can speak about among the people in the, in the room. We want to see faces like this in school. And actually, if I see that at any time during any day, I know that I've made a difference to one child. Thanks for listening.